As we've seen, the idea of dystopia emerges in response to the idea of utopia. In fact, we can say that our conception of dystopia exists only because of our conception of utopia. The sort of binary thinking is not uncommon when dealing with complex and imprecise concepts. After all, we understand good and evil through an ongoing comparative process, don't we? Maybe Orwell was onto something with his newspeak. Instead of labeling something as bad, why not just call it ungood? Even Freud decided to understand the nature of happiness by first understanding the nature of unhappiness. Perhaps the greatest difference between utopia and dystopia is that no one sets out to create something that they would call a dystopia. But we do have a long history of people attempting to create actual utopias. Long before Thomas More gave us the label of utopia, humans sought to create perfect societies. Certainly, Abrahamic religions all see humanity beginning in the ultimate utopia, the terrestrial paradise, the Garden of Eden. So it is perhaps not surprising that throughout the development of the Western world, we see a desire to return to or reestablish a perfect place. In 375 BC, the Greek philosopher Plato wrote Republic, one of his most famous Socratic dialogues. In this treatise, Plato imagined a real country, Callipolis, a city-state designed upon the ideal of justice and ruled by what Plato called philosopher kings. In Plato's ideal society, the population would be divided into four socioeconomic classes, iron, bronze, silver, and gold. Those golden citizens spent their lives training to serve as future philosopher kings, and there's no suggestion that anyone could ever climb up from one of the lower classes. In 1516, Sir Thomas More published what he called, quote, a little true book, not less beneficial than enjoyable, about how things should be in a state. But we need to remember that More's utopia, as the pun suggests, was satire, an ideal society that couldn't exist. More's book was a critique on the state of politics and government in England in the early 16th century, and not a serious attempt to describe a perfect society. America has always, even before it was America, appealed to utopian thinkers. In the early 17th century, the Pilgrims and the Puritans fled religious persecution in England. On board the ship Arabella in 1630, as their voyage across the sea was coming to an end, John Winthrop, the leader of the Puritans, gave a sermon that has echoed throughout the history of this country. In it, he both warned and bragged that, quote, we must always consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. That idea of the city upon a hill, taken from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, has stuck with America's sense of itself ever since. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the Shining City all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with pre-ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. But of course, America is an unlikely place. It's a country built on defiance of the odds, on a belief in the impossible. And as I remind you of this because as you set off on your own lives of success and achievement, it's now your turn to help keep it this way. It's your turn to keep this daringly radical but unfailingly simple notion of America alive. That no matter where you're born or how much your parents have, no matter what you look like or what you believe in, you can still rise to become whatever you want, still go on to achieve great things, still pursue 
the happiness that you hope for. Today, this dream sounds common. It's even become a cliche. Yet for most of human history, it's been anything but. As a servant in Rome, a peasant in China, or a subject of King George, there were very few unlikely futures. No matter how hard you worked or struggled for something better, you knew you'd spend your life forced to build somebody else's empire, to sacrifice for somebody else's cause. But as the centuries passed, the people of the world grew restless. They were tired of tyranny and weary of their lot in life. And as they saw merchants start to sail across oceans and explorers set off in search of new worlds, they followed. And it was right here, right in these waters, where the American experiment began. As the earliest settlers arrived on the shores of Boston and Salem and Plymouth, they dreamed of building a city on a hill. And the world watched, waiting to see if this improbable idea called America would succeed. Not long after it was established as a country, the United States was swept by the Second Great Awakening, a religious revival lasting about 50 years. Beyond simply an increase in religious devotion and fervor, the Second Great Awakening also brought about the birth of a number of utopian movements, most of which, like the Pilgrims and Puritans, began in Europe, but sought greater religious freedom in the United States, including the Shakers from England and the Society of the Women in the Wilderness, the Ephrata Cloister, and the Harmony Society from Germany. In 1948, John Humphrey Noyes founded the Oneida Community, a utopian commune in upstate New York. A few years later, the Amana Colonies, a group of utopian communes, were established in Iowa. All of these groups and many others wanted more than just religious freedom. They wanted to create truly utopian societies within the borders of the expanding United States. We should note that none of these closed societies lasted. The Amana colonies were perhaps the most successful, with the seven communities lasting for about 80 years, until during the Great Depression, they turned themselves into a for-profit corporation and became one of the leading manufacturers of household appliances in the United States. I find it interesting that compared to various lists of dystopian literature, the lists of utopian literature is significantly smaller. Many of those fictional utopias follow the model of the Great Awakening communes. They describe small, isolated communities. In 1915, the feminist writer Charlotte Perkins Gilman wrote the novel Herland about a society of women who have developed the ability to reproduce asexually. Until they're discovered by a pair of male scientists, the women of this land are able to live without conflict and violence. In 1948, the psychologist B.F. Skinner wrote the novel Walden II about a small society in which every aspect of life is approved through rigorous scientific analysis. Needless to say, the idea of free will presents a particular challenge to this society. Another common pattern we see in what is called utopian literature brings us back to the idea of binary opposition I began this video with. In these novels, we're presented with two societies, one utopian and one dystopian. Once again, we're better able to understand the one by comparing it with the other. Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974 novel, The Dispossessed, is possibly the most well-known of this subgenre. Here, the protagonist travels between two planets, one, Inares, which offers an anarchist approach to utopia, a civilization without private property and laws, and the other, Eurus, a planet very much like the United States, in which capitalism and commerce dominate every aspect of society. A novel that offers a similar structure but makes its comparisons via time travel rather than interplanetary travel is Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, in which the protagonist travels from 1970s New York to our world in the year 2137, when the ideals of the counterculture movement have all been achieved and a society that has rid itself of the structural oppression of class, race, and gender exists. Often what happens in utopian literature is that the society itself collapses, or it is exposed as something closer to a dystopia. 
Again, we return to the binary and realize that the polar extremes cannot be maintained. We're often left with that realization that life exists somewhere in the middle. Ultimately, we are left with what Thomas More originally presented to us. A utopia is a good place that does not and cannot exist. It's perhaps an overgeneralization to say this, but it seems to me that when we read dystopian literature, we're often reading about characters who recognize and fight against the oppression within their societies. Whereas in utopian literature, we're often reading about characters who realize that what seems to be a perfect society is in fact far from it. In both, we're working towards the middle ground, a world that is neither great nor horrible.